Okay, so sorry for that uh, slight pause there, everyone. Um, welcome to this evening's talk. I'm really pleased that you're able to join us tonight uh, while we talk about the archaeology of Hungerford. Uh, so my name is Beth Asbury and I'm the Assistant Archaeologist at West Berkshire Council <coughs> with responsibility for the historic environment record and also outreach. I'm joined this evening by my colleague, Dr. Phil Smither, uh, who is the Portable Antiquity Schemes Finds Liaison Officer for the whole of Berkshire. Uh, we're going to take it in turns uh, doing our talks and there should be about 15 minutes at the end left for questions. Uh, so feel free to ask us anything related to the, uh, the presentations this evening. Um, and as Claire has said, we're recording this talk and it will be made available on the West Berkshire Heritage uh, YouTube channel um, later on. So tonight's talk is part of the activities running alongside the Focus on Hungerford exhibition that's on at the moment uh, in West Berkshire Museum until the 12th of September and it's free to visit so do pop along it's got some great stuff in it. Um, if you're not already familiar with it uh, the Hungerford Virtual Museum is another excellent and very well illustrated resource that we in the archaeology team sometimes contribute content to but I'm going to try this evening not to duplicate uh, too much of what uh, is already available on there this evening. So this evening what I'd like to cover is um, who the archaeology team is, what we do and focus on what records we have about Hungerford Parish and how we might help each other learn more about the history of the parishes, uh, sorry the history of the parish and its archaeology. So a little introduction beforehand about how archaeology works in the UK. Um, so archaeological field work, which most people think of when they think of archaeology, uh, is generally split into two different types. Uh, research archaeology, such as that by universities and local societies, but also development-led archaeology, that which is related to building work and planning applications, and which has gradually become more legislated and standardised over about the last 40 years. So archaeology as a profession, uh, despite its subject matter, is not an old one. Uh, since the late 20th century, um, the profession can be seen somewhat as a three-legged stool. Uh, so we have curatorial archaeologists, um, not as in museum curators who look after artefacts from a certain area, um, but over the historic environment of a geographical area. Uh, we are usually employed in local government and we're the ones responsible for asking for field work to take place ahead of development to at least preserve it in records for the future. The contractors who carry out that field work and consultants who liaise with the contractors and the curators on behalf of the developer. So my manager, Sarah, or and I are curatorial archaeologists. So we don't undertake field work in West Berkshire, but we make sure that archaeology is taken into consideration in planning applications to help ensure that it's sustainable development. Since the beginning of last year, we've been part of the planning and regulation team at West Berkshire Council. And informally, we're also part of a group called West Berkshire Heritage, alongside our colleagues West Berkshire Museum um, and at the council-owned Elizabethan Manor of Shaw House. As our name suggests, we cover uh, the 51% of Berkshire that became West Berkshire in the late 90s. The various unitary authorities of East Berkshire are covered by a different team, but based in Berkshire Record Office in Reading, uh, called, slightly confusingly, Berkshire Archaeology. Our work is enshrined in a document called the National Policy, sorry, National Planning Policy Framework, or NPPF. Uh, it says that planning applications have to take heritage assets into account and refer to historic environment records. So we're not just interested in below ground archaeology, but also buildings and upstanding monuments, whole landscapes, parks, gardens, veteran trees, and even ancient hedgerows sites and find spots of artefacts. We record all of these things that we know about in the Historic Environment Record or HGR. The West Berkshire HGR is on a database linked to some GIS mapping software so that we can accurately record where things are. The map on the right shows all the monument records in red. Monuments are the sites, buildings, find spots and so on and archaeological events, that means uh, archaeological fieldwork or pieces of research, in blue. The Hungerford 
is the third biggest parish in West Berkshire after its neighbours Lambourne and Kimbury, and I've outlined it here in purple. We have 547 monument records for Hungerford Parish in the HER and 88 event records. There's a special category of monuments, <coughs> excuse me, called designated heritage assets. These are the nationally or internationally important ones. And you might have heard of listed buildings and scheduled monuments, uh, but there are also registered battlefields. And in West Berkshire, we have one. Uh, registered parks and gardens, we have 14. And also protected wreck sites. But as we don't have a coastline, we don't have any of those. There are 139 listed buildings in um, Hungerford Parish the second largest number in West Berkshire, after Newbury Parish, which has 228, uh, followed closely by Lambourne Parish with 138, so it's one left. Uh, you can see a big concentration um, along Hungerford Town High Street. There's only one scheduled monument uh, in Hungerford Parish, that of a Bronze Age bowl barrow, or a burial mound on Barrow Hill, which is north of Hungerford Newtown and east of North Hidden Farm. I couldn't find a photo of it, unfortunately, but its scheduling description says it's a large bowl barrow with a well-defined mound, 30 metres in diameter and up to 2.6 metres high. There's one registered parking garden in Hungerford, but I'm not sure it really counts, as it's only a very small bit of one that's mostly over the border into Wiltshire. It's the drive up to the registered parking garden around Little Coat House from the Bath Road through Cake Wood. The drive's about a mile long and about three quarters of it, as you can see on the map, are in Hungerford Parish. There are some other uh, sorry, designed landscapes that aren't registered parks and gardens uh, in Hungerford Parish, though, which are Hungerford Park and Chilton Park. And I wonder whether they might meet the criteria, perhaps, for being registered in the future. Oops. Uh, Hungerford Park was surveyed in 2001 and the survey showed, well, Hungerford Park, I should say, before I, I get started, was given by Elizabeth I to the Earl of Essex in 1595. And it still has some of the surviving earthworks from the Elizabethan period and also the late 18th century garden there. And there are traces of the park pale, the um, the barrier, the, the border of the deer park and lots of veteran trees and a fantastic well house as well, with, uh, which still survives, uh, which has a plaque celebrating um, Queen Elizabeth I's coronation. Chilton Park, which is also partly in Wiltshire, um, was, well, in the 1660s, the owner, Sir Bullstrode Whitelock, excellent name, laid out a new walled garden one with a terraced walk and a trout pond was also dug there. It also had a small deer park. Model farm buildings, including workers' cottages, were built on the estate in the 19th century and its 19th century walled garden was used in the popular 1987 BBC TV series, The Victorian Kitchen Garden. So national designations are the responsibility of Historic England. And Historic England makes uh, the list of designated heritage assets available online. And here's the link uh, to that list uh, with information on applying the things to be added to the list and also the application criteria. Anyone can apply to have something added to the list. Uh, and Historic England also has a mechanism by which members of the public can add more information to list entries, such as with information and photos. There are a couple of other uh, local designations as well, that of conservation areas and local listing. So conservation areas are areas of special architectural or historic interest and locally listed heritage assets are those that are of local but not national interest and significance. Giving advice on conservation areas, things on the local list, and also listed buildings, even though um, it's Historic England that decides what buildings to nationally designate, is the responsibility of our colleagues in West Berkshire Council in the conservation team. So Hungerford Parish has two conservation areas, part of Hungerford Town and part of Eddington. Although Hungerford Town is the largest in the parish, it's not the oldest. 
It's not mentioned in Doomsday Book, which was compiled shortly after the Norman Conquest and is effectively a, a register of all the Anglo-Saxon um, assets and land holdings that were there, were there at the time of the Norman Conquest. Eddington and Leverton are, however, which means that they were there before the Norman Conquest and predate Hungerford Town. There are just a couple of groups of locally listed heritage assets in Hungerford Parish. Uh, these are the pillboxes on either side of Dun Mill Lock. They are a type 28 anti-tank gun emplacements on GHQ, that stands for General Headquarters, Stop Line Red which was a line of anti-invasion obstacles uh, built as part of the defence of Britain in 1940 to 1941. These three are described as being comparatively rare survivals as they're close together and in relatively good condition. If you're interested in Second World War archaeology, <coughs> excuse me, there are also some dragon's teeth, another type of anti-tank defence, on the edge of the common opposite the Downgate pub, and these are not locally listed. As with national listing, anyone can apply to have something locally listed. The pro uh, process and the criteria for local listing are set by the West Berkshire Heritage Forum and the criteria are available on the West Berkshire Council website. So looking at Hungerford Common again, in 2005, English Heritage, now Historic England, surveyed seven kilometres squared of Hungerford Port Down and Freeman's Marsh as part of a national project called the Urban Commons Project. The report of their findings was published in 2019 and is available online. On the left is an aerial photo from that report showing some of the earthworks that survive across the common. And on the right is a flavour of the range of features for diff from different periods of time um, that are still present. So the common has probable remains of a prehistoric or Roman field system there's terracing on Freeman's Marsh and extensive quarrying in both areas. There's also extensive post-medieval water meadows and numerous structures from the Second World War, um, Kennet and Avon stop line that I, I mentioned a minute ago. The common also features this character for water trough for horses built in 1904, uh, which is one of the first in the country to be Maine's water fed after Hungerford Waterworks opened in 1903. And it has a plaque. <laughs> so speaking of prehistoric and Roman archaeology, in 1998, when the Platts Brewery site on Everland Road in Hungerford Town was excavated, prehistoric flints and Roman pottery was found. The brewery buildings were partially recorded before um, a Summerfield supermarket, now Tesco, was built. It was a large and mid-19th century vertical brewery. You can see a stoneware flagon from the brewery displayed in the Focus on Hungerford exhibition. John Platt Jr. of the brewery is, uh, also contributed to the gates, overthrow and kissing gate through to St. Lawrence's Church from Parsonage Lane in Hungerford. The church itself is grade two listed and was built in 1816 from Bath Stone, uh, taking advantage of the ability to ship stone along the Kennet and Avon Canal, the stretch of which between Hungerford and Great Bedwin was built in October 1798 and July 1799. And although Hungerford wasn't in Doomsday, there was Saxon activity around the Croft, the area around this church. Pits with late Saxon and early medieval bits of pottery and animal bones were found when the site was excavated um, sorry, a site was excavated uh, before the Hungerford Medical Centre was built in 1996. There was also an earlier 12th century church. Um, during a watching brief in 2003, its 12th century foundations and two unmarked graves were found. Speaking of excavations near churches, in the 1950s, uh, St Bartholomew's Grammar School Archaeology Society excavated some land to the east of what was St Saviour's Church in Eddington, it's now a private house, and found large quantities of early Iron Age to early Roman period pottery. Sometime before the excavation in Eddington, this Roman steel yard and weight, uh, used as a balance for weighing things, was also found somewhere in Eddington and is now in West Berkshire Museum. In around 1170, 
a new town was planned and laid out along the Salisbury Road, what's now Hungerford High Street, a bit of Charnham Street and Church Lane. Over time, Hungerford became an important stop on the London to Bath Road coaching route, which brought visitors and wealth into the town and a demand for coaching inns. There's even a grave to a Bath coachman called uh, James Dean, no less, uh, in St Lawrence's Churchyard. So do go and visit him. The Bear Hotel on Charnham Street is one of the oldest in the country. It's first mentioned in 1464, but possibly dates from the 13th century. The first Turnpike Trust in Berkshire, uh, which were groups set up to maintain roads, but that charged tolls to do so, was in 1714. This period, the Georgian period, was a wealthy one for Hungerford Town and reflected in the facades of lots of the high streets um, buildings, which were put on top of the medieval structures behind them. In 1985, the owner of 129 High Street called this practice superficial facelift, which I rather like. <laughs> so as, as an example of these facelifts, um, this is 84 High Street, uh, a grade two listed uh, building and the only thatched building still in uh, Hungerford High Street. Um, next door to this building, 85 to 86 High Street, um, is actually one of the earliest surviving houses in the whole area, disguised behind mid 19th century and 20th century alterations and a bit of pebble dashing, as you can see in the photo. So together, 85 and 86 High Street are actually a rare survival of a 15th century hall house. It had some of its, uh, it has some of its original roof timbers. And in 2009, Dr. Andy Moyer of Tree Ring Services undertook dendrochronology, which is tree ring dating, of some of those roof timbers and found that the building was probably built in 1449. And it might have looked like the reconstruction on the right. It too is grade two listed. Hungerford Town had another boom in the 19th century after the Kennet and Avon Canal was built, as I mentioned earlier on. And one of Hungerford's, Hungerford Wharf's um, warehouses still survives, though much altered, and some 18th and 19th century canal work cottages as well. Later, Hungerford Railway Station um, was built. Uh, originally, this was the terminus of the Barks and Hans Railway in 1847. However, well, it was a branch line of the main Great Western Railway line from Paddington to Bristol via Reading, but it became a through station of the Great Western Railway in 1862. This meant that people had less reason to stop in Hungerford. Um, use of the canal also declined once the railways were well established and the population of the Hungerford area also declined. The result was that there was little development in the town centre into the 20th century, but with the advantage that lots of well-preserved historic buildings in the town have survived uh, for us to study today. So excavations in the late 20th century along Charnham Lane, northwest of Undy's Farm, ahead of the creation of Charnham Park, uh, that, sorry, the Charnham Park development, Found lots of interesting archaeology from several periods of time, including a very interesting possible Neolithic ceremonial complex, a possible henge form or henge like um, circular structure. It also found one, possibly two, um, maybe Anglo Saxon sunken featured buildings and an abandoned 11th to 14th century farming hamlet. More recently, excavations on land off Salisbury Road have found a deep pit full of over 1,000 early Neolithic period flints, including some really nice examples that uh, Thames Valley Archaeological Services shared on social media on the right hand picture, um, and that are now on display in the Focus on Hungerford exhibition in the museum. Also found on that site have been hundreds of Neolithic pot shards like these ones in the excavation. And I know they don't look very glamorous, but bear in mind that the Neolithic period was when pottery first started to be used in Britain. 
So these examples are some of the earliest examples you can get in this country. So they're quite special. Also, a first or second century AD Roman oil lamp, unusually made of metal. There are only about 30 that have been recorded in England before. And it reminds me of this style of lamp that was introduced to the Shetland Islands uh, in the 17th century called a cruisy lamp, which is also in the museum's collection. One way for local groups to guide development in their area and to identify things to be locally listed is through neighbourhood development plans. The archaeology team can help local communities identify their heritage and what's important to them, for example, by doing uh, HER searches or talks like this, or maybe even walks in their local area when they draw, draw up these neighbourhood development plans. And there's more information about them on both the West Berkshire Council and Historic England websites. Hungerford Town Council, oops, there we go. <laughs> Hungerford Town Council is currently working on a neighbourhood development plan. Uh, a survey was um, taken in 2018 in which over 90% of people said that the historic buildings in the town centre were important. And just over 30% said that heritage had been neglected. So if you'd like to get involved, if you have an interest in the Neighbourhood Development Plan for Hungerford, then the contact details for those who are involved in the council is available on the website, or you can join the mailing list. And I've put the, both relevant links on the slide there. If you'd like to do your own research, then we make many of our monument records available on an Historic England website called Heritage Gateway. And Sarah, my manager, uh, put together a really handy step-by-step -step guide to searching Heritage Gateway for um, West Berkshire records a few years ago. And the link is there on the slide. The West Berkshire Council online map has layers of HER information on it as well, which you can access online for free. You can click on any of those purple dots, lines or shapes and a pop-up box uh, will take you to the relevant record on Heritage Gateway. But be warned, my West Berkshire Museum colleagues have told me it's very addictive playing on this website. Um, if you'd like to request more detailed information that you can find through Heritage Gateway, uh, then you can contact us via our online inquiry form. Phil and I also gave a talk on behalf of West Berkshire Libraries back in March last year about our work and the resources that are available um, to people to do their own research, including a sort of step-by-step -step guide on how to use the council's online map. That talk was also recorded and can be watched on YouTube. It's about 45 minutes long. And the sources that we mention on our slides um, are also in a Word document that you can access on the West Berkshire Heritage website as well. If you're doing research or you're out and about and you find something that isn't on the HER already, or you come across a record that needs enhancing, then we have an online reporting form as well. And please do share with us what you find so that I can add it to the HER um, and then it can help inform archaeological work in the future. We're based in the council's offices in Market Street in Newbury rather than the museum. And you can get in touch with us by post at this address, um, phone or email. Um, and find out more about us on both the West Berkshire Council and West Berkshire Heritage website. If you use social media, I'm responsible for the team's Facebook, Twitter and Instagram uh, accounts, apart from Phil, so I'm sure he'll share his links with you momentarily. And on the West Berkshire Heritage website, you might be pleased to know that we have a page of local heritage trails. Most importantly, of course, one for Hungerford Town Centre, hence the smiley face on my slide. <laughs> if anyone has kids or grandkids or uh, who like archaeology or if you're interested in meeting Phil and me in person, then we'll both be at Hungerford Library during the school half term in February on Tuesday the 22nd. We're also hosting several events for the Festival of Archaeology, which is a nationally organised um, extravaganza <laughs> which takes place every year um, and run by the Council for British Archaeology. So keep an eye out for activities that we're running uh, in July 
um, on the West Berkshire Heritage website um, and on our social media accounts. Okay, so thank you very much for listening and over to Phil. Let's see about sharing my screen a second. Uh, I'm sure I still had. Does that look about right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> you mute, so. Um, yes, yeah, so, cheers, Beth. Um, yeah, so as uh, Beth said at the beginning, um, my name is Phil. I am what's known in Berkshire as the Vines Liaison Officer, um, and I work for a national scheme called the Portable Antiquity Scheme, um, recording uh finds by the general public so not from archaeological investigation um primarily through uh, metal detectorists where we get about 90 percent of our finds from um but often the other 10 percent um are from garden finds uh people out just field walking various other other places um i work out of west berkshire museum um i've also travel over to East Berkshire and uh, Reading and Maidenhead to meet uh, to meet people who have found things. So just a bit of an, as an introduction to who we are at the Port of Antiquities. Um, the scheme itself started in 1997. This was a response to the, the new Treasure Act, um, which meant certain objects of precious metal or groups of coins um, or certain finds over a certain particular age. Um, have to be reported legally reported as treasure and this is a process in which um, the uh, local or national museums are able to acquire finds for further research and display from uh, from the finders and landowners and, and go back into that in a bit later when I've got an actual treasure find to show you. Um, the position recording finds in Berkshire as a finds liaison officer used to be split between counties which is Oxfordshire and, and Surrey but now since 2018 there's been a dedicated um, person um, in Berkshire kind of filling a gap between counties and making it easier for people to come visit and uh, and and uh, record finds. Um, last year or actually December 2020 we hit 5,000 finds actually recorded from West Berkshire and now that's gone definitely above that, maybe even towards the 6,000 mark, um, as I'm not the only person that records finds from West Berkshire. Um, people travel around to detect and, and find things, so often they'll go to the person who's closest to them. So some of my colleagues around the country have recorded finds from West Berkshire, including one as far as uh, away as Durham. Um Across the whole of Berkshire itself, there's 7,200 plus finds. Again, that's probably up to around about 8,000 now, actually. So uh, I need to update this slide a bit. Um, so just to give you an example of the area in which we're talking about is, um, is the whole of Berkshire here. You can see uh, there's primarily a lot from, from West Berkshire. That's where the hotspots are, say, but there are particular areas around the county that are ripe for, for metal detectorists, and they usually are the more rural areas. So that particularly that takes into West Berkshire and parts of Windsor and Maidenhead um, quite a bit. This slide I have updated since last year, and this is a bit of a breakdown of the finds by period um, from, from the whole of West Berkshire. Um, Primarily, it's Roman. We get lots of Roman coins in. Um, uh, and then the medieval and post-medieval are really well represented. Um, but as you can see, the difference in percentages, 80% of the Roman finds are coins, whereas the post-medieval and post-medieval, um, it's a much lower percentage of coins here. So we're getting more objects. And these are the periods where this kind of starts to move towards the mass production of of metal objects, especially into the post-medieval, and then as soon as you get to the industrial periods, there's a there's a lot more there. Um, we're represented in the um, in the prehistoric periods through flints, so it's not all about metal finds. We get people who spot unworked flints, hand axes, scrapers, that kind of thing, um, all by 
by eye. And there is some interesting activity in the Iron Age and early medieval period, more than I'd thought around here before I started. So that's uh, becoming quite interesting. As for the number of finds we um, record from around here, um, a few years back, there was quite a lot being recorded, uh, less so in more recent years, mostly due to the uh, the pandemic and the switching over of, uh, of flows. But as you can see, the last few years, despite um, COVID and not being able to meet people as much, there's a lot more uh, being found uh, being found in Berkshire these days. So uh, who knows what will come in 2022. And just to give you a bit of an idea of the county of origin of where I record things from, it's all over the place. So um, some of these were done prior to me, but as you can see, people go all over the place to detect and find find objects to bring in to show me. So uh, there's quite a lot uh Quite a lot of people go visit a lot of places. But as this is a focus on Hungerford, um, out of the 5,000 plus finds from West Berkshire, in Hungerford, we have approximately 19 finds on the PAS database. Now, um, this is due to several reasons. There's like various biases built in. It depends if people are doing detecting their uh, reporting finds to the PAS. Um, there's a certain urban spread around Hungerford as well, which, I mean, you can't metal detect over concrete, so that makes it, um, where there's urban areas, it means there's a um, means there's fewer finds. Um, but we do have some rather interesting objects from Hungerford, despite the small number. Coins-wise, uh, the Iron Age is well represented here um i'm going to go into those in a bit of detail now and then i'll go on to the other the other periods in a bit so in the iron age this is the um the ones we have and actually this is a really good representation of the area of the country as a whole um early on we've got coins of um the virginia Atrabati, so the southern tribe for want of a better word and the local one the Atrabati is around the Reading area, around Silchester. Um, the Bell guy who move over from uh, northern France, um, people come over and keep producing coins still, um, and they would have come in through Portsmouth, Selsey Way, etc. And then we do have ones coming over from the east of the of the region. So in East Wiltshire region, that's been identified um, as a small group, and the Dubunny, who are even further. Oh, sorry, not east, west of here. So there's one who are even further, further west. Um, and why this is really important around Hungerford and around Berkshire in general is because it's a very central area for these coins to be mixing and being potentially traded or moved around from there, uh, from the areas where they've been minted. So this is this is really cool to see. And then in the first century. Uh, a, a first century AD, we have the first coins around Hungerford that have, uh, I, uh, we're able to identify a ruler on them. So we have Verica, who was a king of the Atrabates in Silchester, and which you'd expect to find around here. But then we have Cunabellin and Epathicus, who were the Casavalani, all the way over in Essex, whose group end up taking over vast waves of. Um, the south, east, and towards uh, the west of the country, um, of the region in the first century AD. And Epathicus must have been, so he's a brother of Canobolin, um, must have been quite prolific around here because his coins are one of the most frequently found in Berkshire and the one I've probably recorded, recorded the most of. Um, so just as an example, this is one of the... Uh, uh, one of the coins that we find around here on the Iron Age ones, um, just quite a nice little silver, silver example. So, as for other coins, though, the Roman is isn't as well represented as our areas in Hungerford. We have one of Constantius, one of the House of Constantine. These are very, very worn um, late Roman coins of the fourth century. In the medieval, it's more the early point in that medieval period, so around. Um, 
eleven eighty to um so like the twelve uh twelve twenties, etc. Um so very early in that point. But we do have a very, very interesting post-medieval coin. So we're talking um the Reformation around that time, which is this. It was on Beth's first slide, actually, the one she picked out, which I'm glad about. Um, it's a gold-plated uh, lead alloy, probably pewter, um, or a Portuguese coin. Now, this coin would have, would have been made, or this forgery even, would have been made in Portugal and brought over here um, and trying to pass it off as, as the real deal. Now, maybe somebody over here wouldn't have spotted that, but at the time in the post-medieval period, so we're talking 16th, um, particularly in the 16th century, you get a lot of um, foreign coins, particularly uh, Portuguese, Spanish, um, and French, and some Italian, um, coming over and being used as well for small change because at that point there was a lack of small change coinage, and that goes all the way through to um, William the Third in the late. 17th century so a lot of this foreign coinage um, was accepted um, in Britain because it was the same size and weight as small change then so nobody really minded the difference so while it probably was illegal to be doing it was tolerated to keep to keep things running um, there is also another one that isn't quite a coin but is close to it um, I'm not sure exactly what this is, but we think it's a trial piece of a penny of King Stephen. It's a lead coin. Um, it's got the obverse and reverse of the coin that you'd expect of King Stephen's. Um, and so it might be a trial for the die. So in the mint, when the die maker has um, cut the die, they hammer it to make sure it, it will work on, on the, uh, the metal flan to create the coin. Um, it could be a customs token, but some research into this shows that where it's found and um, the use of customs tokens is probably a trial piece for an actual an actual coin. Now, why this is so far from the mint, who knows? Um, it could have been passed off as a coin at some point or used as a token, but um, it does seem to be a, a, a trial coin. And then even more into this, uh, we have jettons as well. So these look like coins, but what they are is they're also known as, you might have heard of reckoning counters. Um, they're used in accounting um, on a big board to uh, a bit, almost a bit like an abacus for counting, but a bit more sophisticated. Um, this one is slightly unusual. We normally get jettons from from Germany, which are known as Nuremberg um, jettons or Tournai in France. Um, this one was a jetton of a master. These are the, the masters of the people who create the coin, these jettons, um, called Conrad Laufer, um, a master from 1637 to 1668. Um, this is one of contemporary, so it'd be Louis the Fourteenth, and given his rule starts in 1643, that narrows down when this uh, could have been created. So it uses similar dies to a coin, but it's not an actual tradable coin uh, that, that you could actually uh, spend in the market or in the shops. And I spoke about treasure. So one really interesting object that we find is probably one of the most common treasure items that comes through the PAS. Um but is no less spectacular in itself, is uh, Bronze Age gold rings. Now, this one is actually a gold-plated one. It has a copper alloy, um, copper alloy core, and we still have really no idea what these were used for. People, they've been known commonly as ring money, but they seem to not have any connection to any form of economy or trade at the time. They could have been used for jewellery. We're wondering if um, string was wrapped around them for pendants, if there had been maybe some way of attaching as an earring for a large, a large piercing in the earlobe. Um, no one still, no one absolutely knows, but the one thing we can very well be certain of is they don't 
they're not uh, money in any way. But what's cool about this is this one was actually acquired by West Berkshire Museum um, as a treasure of time. So it's in the uh, West Berkshire Museum collection. And actually, funnily enough, on the database, uh, one of my favourite finds is from Hungerford. This was recorded by my colleague Ed in Oxfordshire, but as he founded Hungerford. And it's a seal matrix um, for sealing wax on letters. And the description has been put down as a sleeping lion with one further animal. Um, it's thought to, thought to be a squirrel, but I'm not entirely sure it is. But I think at times I could very much resonate with the, uh, the uh, inscription on this, which when uh, stamped into wax would read, wake me no man. Um, I'm sure the person who was uh, receiving the letter would have wanted to wake up the the sleeping lion and open the letter, but sometimes I uh, I uh, feel what's on this uh, this seal matrix there. Um, so, and I thought I'd do a bit of a comparison of these seal matrices. So, uh, in the post medieval period, this one dates to around about the 1600s. Um, seal matrices were becoming more common for sealing letters. Um, you could have your own one made with your own initials on it or your own coat of arms. Um, but that was becoming less and less popular at that point. Or you could buy what we term today as like off-the-shelf examples. So this um, image of a sleeping lion and another animal with the words wake me no man um, has been found up and down the country. So we don't know if they were made in one particular place or if it was something that was being made in various different places. I mean, you can see actually there's quite a few close to this area the one in Hungerford there are a few from around Oxford and some a couple up towards Worcester which isn't that far away so the spread there just shows they're used everywhere but might they might have actually been made around this area somewhere um, so that's about it for the finds of Hungerford um, if anyone is or knows people who metal detect or and wants to come and record their finds with the PAS um, you can contact me on the uh, on the email address there um, or contact any of the flows through the contact link on finds.org.uk, which is the Portable Antiquity Scheme website. Um, as a scheme, we typically record anything over 300 years old, and that's where treasure plays a part because any objects of precious metal and um, certain coin groups um, over 300 years old is what the Treasure Act is about um, anything younger than that. Um, so 1721 at the moment, we don't record as treasure, but our remit is pretty much to record anything before 1721 at the moment. So if you find anything, even if it's in your back garden, we'd be really interested to, uh, to see it. And if you want to know more about the Treasure Act and what class, what we class as treasure and what, and what we don't um, can be found again on the, uh, the finds.org.uk website. Um, there's plenty of links on there, loads of information about archaeology and objects, um, guides to different object types. And it's where you'll find all the information about the finds from Hungerford and uh, and from all around the country. So really, that is about all from me. And uh, yes, thanks for joining us and thanks for listening.